So good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see you back here. I hope you've been enjoying another fine day of stimulating politics, literature and art. Uh, it's my great pleasure after being here yesterday for the very depressing topic of the lessons from Iraq for Syria. Uh, it's rather wonderful to be here today with uh, inspiring artists uh, from Saudi Arabia, Manal al Dawayan. Uh, you can see all around you some examples of her work uh, from her exhibition, I Am, which she will tell us some more about. Uh, Manal is from the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. Uh, she's lived in different parts of the Middle East, and I was just learning that she worked in the oil industry for a decade uh, before becoming an artist uh, full-time just a few years ago, uh, partly uh, inspired by a, a residency at the Delfina Foundation, which brought her very close to here. And we're going to hear from Manal a bit more about her art, her work, about Saudi Arabia, uh, and we'll have an opportunity for you guys to throw in your own questions a little bit later in the discussion. We're just making sure that she gets to have a very loud voice. Can I and uh, without further ado, Manal, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. So I can, yeah, you can hear me. So I prefer to speak while I stand. Feel free. Um, so I started, I was invited to do this talk. Uh, originally, it was supposed to be a panel talk. And then uh, somehow I got uh, changed to giving a long talk where I had to prepare actual text. And then as I approached, yesterday, the tent, to see exactly how they described my talk. I read, Manal will talk about her I Am Photography exhibition, OK, acceptable, and the experience of being a woman in Saudi Arabia. And I was like, oh my goodness, how am I <laughs> going to cover the experience of a woman in Saudi Arabia in 20 minutes? And really, it's just like asking a, a Scottish woman, can you describe your experience as a Scottish woman in 20 minutes? And it's, it's just a question that always, or a description that always comes up uh, when I'm around, whether in uh, interviews, art exhibitions, or panels like these. So I'll give you a little glimpse into the uh, not so common uh, idea of what uh, the Saudi Arabian woman's experience really is about. First of all, I'll set the stage for you where I grew up. Um, in 1933, Saudi Arabia signed an agreement with an oil company called California Standard Oil to come look for oil in Saudi Arabia. This company built a compound in an area called Dahran. And this compound was sort of designed to look like Southern California, a little bit of Houston, Texas, so that all the American engineers that came in and the geologists would feel at home and bring their families. And in this compound, I was born, I lived my whole life, and I still live there. As a child, my parents would take us to Houston, Texas for work. My father was an oil man. And I would say, Mama, look, Houston is like Saudi. Little did I know that Saudi was like Houston. Um, I participated. The lifestyle within that compound was very unique. There were baseball games, Halloween, Thanksgiving. It was really Americana uh, uh, lifestyle. And within that small border, and it was a gated community, uh, uh, only people that were working within the oil company had access to it. So I would leave this compound to the outer circle, which was uh, Saudi Arabia, Khobar, the Dammam, the eastern province, where my grandmother and aunts all lived. That was a completely different experience, where the law was women need to wear veil, women can't drive, and all the Saudi traditions. And then beyond that, if you were to leave Saudi Arabia, I would need uh, a permission slip from a male guardian, who was my father at one point. And then when he passed, it was my youngest brother, who I changed his diapers. And, and uh, eventually, he became my guardian, allowing me to travel within the border of my country. And of course, after the September 11th, uh, uh, problems, problems, put in a very simple way, there was a huge difficulty for me to enter other countries through visas, and, and borders became sort of a lifestyle. 
I, as being somebody that does not fit into the, uh, the mold of the terrorist, could navigate myself back and forth between these circles. So I had Dahran, the compound, Saudi Aramco, Saudi, and then beyond Saudi. So I had a very strange upbringing. But when I started practicing art, the focus, and it slowly appeared to me, I didn't realize it, was most of my work was participatory art. And uh, with discussions with my gallerist and, and friends, it was sort of a, 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 a trying to belong to this community that I was so disconnected from because I didn't have the exact same culture. So I started by doing projects where I invited women to come and work on art with me. And it was sort of a way for me to project my ideas, but through the group voice. And it became a challenge or an exercise of belonging. I started with this collection, the I Am collection. That was one of my first ever projects uh, produced in 2005, which was about nine years ago. And uh, I, it was instigated by a speech that King Abdullah gave when he took the throne in Saudi Arabia. And in that speech, he had uh, a a moment where he spoke about women will participate in building Saudi Arabia alongside men. At that point in Saudi Arabia, uh, women's employment was at 3%. Uh, college graduates, women, were 60%. There were more than men. So you can imagine all these talented, brilliant women were just sitting at home, not able to work or produce or, or give to the country. So you can imagine that statement that King Abdullah made and the excitement that came out out of the uh, women within the country. The next day, immediately, opinion leaders and, and uh, politicians within the region started saying, oh, hold on, don't get excited. Uh, women will join the workforce, but you know, with some control uh, in jobs that suit their nature. That was their statement. So I started to question, what suits my nature? And who exactly is going to decide what suits my nature as a woman? So I looked around me. I was working at that point uh, in oil. Uh, my father actually came to my graduation from undergraduate with uh, employment papers. So he was a firm believer of no time off. You work, and, and he really understood the idea of uh, the importance of financial independence for women uh, within their community. So I turned around to the women around me who were already working. You know, these people that were saying women will work within uh, industries that are soft industries just did not have a link with reality. Women were working, they were producing, they were coming up with amazing ideas, winning awards in science. And I invited these women to pose for me. So I came up with the I Am collection. So you have I Am an educator, I Am a computer scientist, um, I am a filmmaker, I'm a producer, I'm a doctor, I'm a petroleum engineer, and so on and so forth within all those tents. After this project that was uh, shown extensively, I decided to work on another large-scale participatory project. Large scale at that point was uh, uh, about 100 people, less than 100. So I, sent, I decided to address the issue of guardianship, which I told you where a woman, a Saudi woman, cannot travel unless she has a permission slip from her male guardian. This is just the beginning of the idea of the guardianship because women cannot get a job without the permission of a guardian. She cannot check into a hospital. She cannot open a bank account. She, basically, a lot of levels of control where women were perpetual minors. We always had to have a minder, a guardian, uh, at every step. So I just wrote an email. Social media was not that big those days. So I wrote an email saying, you know what, I who would like to donate their permission slip for an art project? I was not known. Uh, it, the permission slip has personal details of women and their guardian. And it has uh, the logo of the Ministry of Interior. So it was quite you know, dangerous, I guess, for somebody to give me this personal document. I had 100, uh, 200 women respond to this email and send me their permission slips. I uh, placed it on the body of fiberglass doves and hung them uh, in an installation in Dubai. And then it went on to, they flew to the Venice Biennale, and now they are part of the permanent collection in Doha. Then I thought, well, this was fun. And I had women saying, yes, we don't like this idea, and we're, we're talking about it together. 
So I looked for the second uh, participatory project that I launched was called My Name, Ismi. And it was about a social issue where uh, in Saudi Arabia, men find it shameful to pronounce the names of their wives, mothers, or daughters. And I started questioning this thing. So they would call the wife the mother of my children or um, the mother of uh, Khalid or Faisal. And, and the name was always sort of uh, hidden because it stems, I think, from the idea of veiling. But it has zero basis, not in religion or in tradition. Uh, in religion, the Prophet had always mentioned the names of his wives. In the Quran, there's women's names. So it has no basis there. And in tradition, Bedouins actually identified the members of their tribe through their mothers because the men all had the same last name, usually. So it did not exist within the Bedouin tradition. So I decided, let's address this. I put out on my website, on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, I'm doing a participatory art project. This is the theme. Would you like to participate? 400 women signed up. And I traveled across Saudi Arabia from the east to the west doing workshops where I would sit with these women and say, here's the case. What do you think? And then they would say their opinions. We'd have a big dialogue in the room. There were so many women that came in, more than the ones that I needed. Some of them, I told them, you can't participate. The seats are full. They're like, we'll just sit in the room. We don't mind. And then this triggered sort of an idea of how this platform of gathering uh, women, the largest gathering I've ever seen of women, sort of discussing a social issue together. And there was a sense of energy within the room uh, that pushed me to do more and more participatory art projects. So after ISMI, I started exhibiting abroad, showing in museums, in galleries. Uh, I was published in a lot of newspapers. But I've started noticing, when I stepped out of the belonging circles of uh, trying to fit in, where everybody's already accepted me in Saudi, I go out abroad, and then uh, museums really want to categorize me and stereotype me into the, the typical oppressed Saudi story. Examples of this were uh, I, um, a very famous artist from New York came in, Marina Abramovich. She's a performance artist. She wanted to meet Saudi artists. She was deeply disappointed to see me without a veil. <laughs> Actually, the person that set up the meeting was like, can you put on your veil before you come. I was, I was like, I'm not. I can't. Yeah, we're. We also um, recently went to um, uh, the studio of an artist called Rakib Shaw in London. And he had invited a few guests waiting for the Arab women. Me and my uh, friend here, Ala, had gone. And his guests were very deeply disappointed that the Arab women look normal. And we were not as exotic as they had imagined and wanted us to be. And Things like this always come up where uh, interviews, journalists always want to know about, have you ever been censored? How is life uh, for a woman in Saudi Arabia? And what are the challenges of being? These are the three typical questions that I get asked every single time. Nobody has ever looked at the art and asked me about the art process and the concept. It's just the same exact question being uh, brought up over and over. So I find that this journey within my zones and my borders was quite easy. And building a belonging to my community was easy. But now when I step out and I want to sort of disconnect from this community that I, I worked on so long and belong to the global stage, I'm being pushed back. We want you to be within that circle so we can identify who you are. So what's popular now in the West is the Middle Eastern show the Arab Women Show, the Saudi Women Exhibition. Just last week, I received an email from a Berlin gallery. I was so excited. And Berlin is quite progressive and interesting. And he proposed uh, giving me an exhibition. And so I asked him to send me a proposal with a title. The title of the show that he was putting together was called The Dance of the Seven Veils. <laughs> yeah, and when will we step out of that? So there is. The final point that I'm going to make now is that there is progress in Saudi Arabia, believe it or not. There is dialogue. I'm allowed, I've shown all my work in Saudi Arabia. The press has published every single newspaper in the kingdom. 
conservative to liberal, has published my pictures, my artworks. Even the doves that had uh, the documents were put in the magazine of the in-flight uh, magazine of Saudi Arabian Airlines. So there, the idea that the censorship that people have in their head does not exist, there's a huge support for my art. There's big dialogue. Of course, there are problems, social, political, at all levels, but there is progress. And will this fixation on stereotyping of a Saudi woman stop this progress? Is it standing in our way? I don't know. But I apologize that I do not fit uh, into the uh, Saudi Arabian experience that you had expected, but I hope that this talk would uh, send you out to the internet and look at my artwork and other uh, Saudi artists that are producing very interesting projects that are not the dance of the seven veils. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>So I wanted to ask you all about being oppressed and how terrible it is. Um, but no, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the art scene in Saudi Arabia now. Uh, we seem to be hearing a bit more about this now in the UK with things like the Edge of Arabia exhibitions and gallery. You mentioned before that the, uh, the photo over there uh, of the woman filmmaker with the clapperboard is a portrait of Haifa al-Mansur, the director of the first film to be directed by a Saudi woman, Wajda. And when I was coming through Edinburgh on the way here, I picked up a leaflet that was advertising the first performance at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival by a Saudi female performer. Yeah, a comedian. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it seems like a lot's happening, but, but why? And who, who is leading it? And how do you see it all? So um, in Saudi Arabia, there are no museums. Up until three to four years ago, we had no galleries also. We have no art schools. So the majority of the creativity that's coming out is very grassroots and very real. The government is not funding any of our art projects or art movements or shows or exhibitions. Even our participation at the Venice Biennale was privately funded and, and funds were raised for it. So. Uh, it's completely, and I think because it's so grassroots and so raw that it's, it's super interesting. And people are recognizing that there is something bubbling under the surface. Mm -hmm. And then it, now's the time to actually follow what's happening in Saudi Arabia. But what's also helped within the region, especially me for, to, to give up my job uh, of 10 years in oil and become a full-time artist is what's happening in Dubai, which is uh, an hour away from where I live by plane. A Biennale was started at the Sharjah Biennale, uh, a, an art fair, which is called Art Dubai. And there's about 70 galleries in Dubai. And then now there's galleries opening up all across the Gulf. So, and then Christie's moved in, Sotheby's, the auction houses. So you've got a secondary market that's interested in, in Middle Eastern art and specifically uh, Gulf art. And then you have the young collectors um, who are uh, extremely opinionated about what they want to buy. They're not following any structure of, I like it, I connect with it, I'm getting it. And so that creates sort of a, an, a market industry mm -hmm. that can support artists and we can continue to produce art and, and independently from jobs. Um, I am unique though, They're not all artists are full time. Uh, many have to have a, a secondary job to support their artistic practice. So I hope that answers your question. And you were talking before about the notion of cultural leadership. Do you think there's a few leaders or role models that are really inspiring this wave? Well, cultural leadership is something that did not come on the radar at all before. And I think this is something new. And this is, I think this audience needs to hear about it because, uh, because of funding that came from the Delfina Foundation, from Beyond Borders, from the Clinton Foundation inviting me in to speak and, and pa giving me a platform of this sort to uh, sort of open people's minds through culture and art. And, and art is so unique in the way that it just talks to everybody at all levels. It has no language. You look at it, you like it, or you hate it, or you're just indifferent to it. So this is a way of communicating. But within my community, uh, cultural leadership is safer. Uh, people are more, it's, you feel a, more approachable and, and l 
cultural leadership can be mixed up with being uh, a role model uh, or a leader. It's safer than political Yes, like, uh, just uh, affiliating. All these women that came and attended my workshops, had there been a, a political activist, I think they would have been like, yeah, I'm not interested. But because of mm -hmm. uh, art as a platform, and it's just an expression uh, of, of feelings and thoughts, it feels safer. And, and for organizations to fund this kind of uh, leadership is integral uh, policy, I think. And this is something that we talked about when we were in Little Rock, Arkansas, with um, we had uh, 80 former Democratic leaders listening to us and waiting for policy making. And we, I, I spoke about the importance of cultural leadership alongside um, uh, Gina Davis, uh, the actress, uh, who also was promoting the same thing. And then finally, at the end of the session, uh, one of their recommendations was about supporting cultural leadership and its importance and, uh, in, in making a change in the world. Thank you. I think uh, we've got 10 minutes left of this session, so it's your chance, people in the audience, if you'd like to ask Manal a question. I see there's a lady over here. Hi, Manal. It's maybe not much of a question. It's about the beautiful surprise that when you spoke about your piece of all the doves with the uh, identi identification card. I was at the Biennale and I saw it. Oh, okay. But I thought I'd share with you something. I was with a, a very good friend of mine and we're both interested in contemporary art. That's why we were at the Biennale. And she is very Jewish and very uh, feels very strongly about anybody who is um, from Islamic, right? So we walked by the in front of the exhibition and said, let's go in here. And she said, oh no, I am not going to see any of that kind of art. So I said to her, would you mind? No, then I said, okay, let's walk around the block. I figured I have a whole block to convince her. <laughs> so I said, let's walk around the block. And then when we approached it again, she said, I'm still not going to go because it's going to be anti-Jewish and anti-Israel and blah, 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 blah. So I said, would you please wait for me outside for half an hour because I'm going to go and see it. And then she felt embarrassed about being because she considers herself a very liberal, open-minded person. She said, okay, I'll go in with you. And we walked in and we saw your piece and she began to cry. She loved it so much. So there is something you have achieved indirectly. Yeah. So Brilliant. I have no question just <laughs> to share that wonderful Thank experience. You. Thank you. Other questions or comments? <laughs> Sorry, I have again. Um, it's it's very interesting. I think in in, in comp comparing the emancipation of women in art in different countries. Uh, in in our country, it had quite an interesting kind of uh, trajectory. Uh, female authors, particularly Jane Austen, the, the Bronte sisters, were were some of the first most high profile women to to, to create art. And we had a, an interesting relationship with women on stage. Um, you mentioned the female comedian. I think it would possibly be more, idea, more difficult to f find a, a Saudi actress at the current time. Can you tell us what the likely trajectory is in your country for, for all, all different genres of art becoming, becoming equal access for both men and women? And indeed, th those areas where no one makes particular areas of art at the moment because they're, they're less... Um, seen as less uh, uh, ideal. Thank you. So um, there are Saudi actresses. We have soap operas, and we have uh, uh, very dramatic soap operas on TV <laughs> that my mother absolutely loves and I cannot stand. But uh, actresses exist. There are TV productions. There are TV, um, uh, studios. So th things exist like almost normal. So. Um, we don't have theater. We don't have movie theaters. So, but people travel to Dubai and Bahrain to watch movies. So you would think um, because there's no movie theaters that our film industry is non-existent. But some of the most active filmmakers come out of Saudi, both men and women, uh, winning awards in the region and abroad. Uh, comedians is a big thing now in Saudi, and these comics uh, because 
there are no platforms. They use the internet. So they're on YouTube, and each these comedians are folk heroes right now in Saudi, and they have like millions and millions of followers. When they uh, uh, issue an episode, everybody watches them, and they get away with murder. What they do on these episodes, they make fun of uh, politics, of social uh, attitudes, and of religious figures too, which is uh, historically was untouchable, but now. It's open to everybody to go uh, to go at them. Uh, what's and, and of course contemporary art now is very big in Saudi, but art has existed since the 60s, and and there were scholarships of uh, artists were sent uh, on scholarships to study uh, abroad. So there is a creative movement. There is sort of an industry, but we don't have the right infrastructure yet. There's a museum being built. Uh, where I live, which has a humongous theater and exhibition halls, but it's being built and it's scheduled for 2015. Uh, there are questions about how, how ready people are for this museum. So you build it, will they come? Have they, if you've never been to a theater, uh, how are you going to behave when you go to your first show? And, and these issues are being brought up within the press, within uh, small discussions and, and panels. Uh, we don't have art schools. So you can imagine that everything is sort of self-taught or uh, emulated from whatever scene from abroad. This is sort of weak uh, in its structure. We don't know who's going to run these institutions when they're built. Uh, so obviously, we're going to import talent, which is really upsetting with 26 million uh, people in the country and a, a lot of um, unemployment. Why aren't we training young people to, to hold positions within the creative industry, which is an important industry? And, and, and actually can occupy uh, a good part of uh, money making for the country, but because we're oil producing, we're not li really looking for any other industries. So that's it. Yeah. Question here at the back. I wasn't here at the ver very beginning of your talk, um, but I was wondering when you're in your country walking the streets, do you have to dress in a certain way? Or yes. Can you be like you are now? No, I ha uh, uh, it's a law to wear a veil in Saudi. For everybody. Even if you were in Saudi, you would have to wear a veil. <laughs> Any last questions? Back here. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Alaikum salam. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting talk. Um, like a few minutes ago, you were talking about scholarships, and um, and I've been, you know, because I've studied abroad in many in different countries, and in each country I visit, there is always a huge uh, like a Saudi community there, mm -hmm. and and from what I understand, there are like hundreds of thousands of scholarships given out. Um, ever since uh, uh, King Abdullah uh, became king, and I was wondering, has has that you know that boom of scholarships um, of you know hundreds of like uh, tens of thousands of Saudis you know studying abroad and then coming back to Saudi, has that from your from your point of view as a, as an artist and and uh, you know seeing the arts like the art scene in Saudi, has that impacted in any way? That's a good question. My father was part of the first batch of Saudis to be sent out to study abroad. And it was thousands and thousands of Saudis that were sent mostly to America to come back with engineering degrees. And that was a vision that came out from King Faisal where he wanted Saudis to, to work within the oil industry from digging for oil up to being the CEO of, of the oil company, which the oil company in Saudi Arabia is the largest oil company in the world. It's, it's uh, worth $10 trillion. Uh, so it's the most valuable country. It, it runs the largest uh, oil uh, uh, wells in the world. So that was the first generation that went out, came back, and started building the country. I actually made a whole collection, uh, a photographic collection about this generation that saw extreme poverty and drought and sickness and, and, and life expectancy of 40 and then 
just in a few years, it flipped to extreme wealth and education. So that was the first generation. Then came the 90s and the Gulf War. And this is my years when I was in college. There were no scholarships for women or men. It was very rare that people went out on scholarships. And then came King Abdullah in 2005, where he launched a completely new program called the King Abdullah Scholarship. And he sent out about 30,000 students, but not just to America, to China, to Korea, to New Zealand, Australia, the UK, all over the world. 50% of our population is under the, t the age of 25. So you can imagine when all of these young people come back and what's going to happen when they come back. I wouldn't know how to, uh, but I know that from my father's experience, things changed dramatically when his generation came back being educated and, and you know, they wanted to get into the workforce and work. Right now, there's a completely different situation for young Saudis that are coming back from these scholarships. There's less jobs, um, less money to go around because the population has exploded. And, um, and there, the world has changed uh, politically, even within our region. So uh, all I can say is uh, it's going to be interesting times in Saudi in the coming years. Thank you very much. And it's fascinating that you mentioned in the leaflet about this exhibition, which everyone should collect from outside, that women are also the majority of uh, university students in, in Saudi Arabia. And that must be another interesting factor for change. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> We're out of time. Uh, so it just remains for us to thank Manal in the traditional fashion for being with us today. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.